Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. So uh, well, I had to struggle with a little bit of challenge to get online. So uh, we want to talk about uh, the observable variability in uh, pathology and look into possibilities how uh, artificial intelligence could eventually help to mitigate the effects and the impact of observable variability. So, um, I, uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is Hamid Tizush. I'm the director of Kimia Lab at the University of Waterloo, uh, a member of Waterloo AI Institute and a faculty affiliate to uh, Vector Institute. So, I have, uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, disclosures. Uh, so, at the moment, I have I'm doing some consulting activities for you on digital pathology. So, the motivation, of course, for us is that uh, we know in US. That almost 12 million people uh, experience some sort of diagnostic error every year. The numbers of uh, the number of fatalities are very different. I have heard numbers anywhere between 25,000 to 250,000 uh, death uh, per year because of uh, some sort of errors. 28% um, of diagnostic mistakes have uh, some sort of life-threatening results and permanent disability. And just uh, as an example, breast cancer misdiagnosis, uh, link, misdiagnosis costs almost $4 billion a year. So that's a, that's a serious uh, uh, problem. And it could be that in the specific cases where we are working, the numbers appear to be uh, small, but then when you scale it up and, and when you look at, the, look at the population, you will see the impact. Well, medical imaging is a large field with uh, many, many different branches from uh, CT and uh, ultrasound and uh, MRI uh, to PET, OCT and so on. Uh, microscopy is of course our focus and digital pathology in particular as virtual microscopy. And there are millions and millions of images being captured every year for uh, different purposes, but mainly for diagnostic purposes. So if we, if we look at misdiagnosis as, as one of the major uh, problems uh, that we have, so there are different types of error generally. So there could be an scanning error that we, we fail to fixate on specific areas when we are looking at images. And it could be a recognition error that we fail to detect abnormality. So we, we, we go over it, we basically see it, but we we do not recognize it, but most problems happen in decision-making errors. So when almost 50% of error is by incorrect interpretation of malignant benign as a benign malignant uh, lesion or uh, uh, tissue. So uh, this, is a, this is a problem that we have spent a lot of time, uh, the clinical community, the, the uh, research community, the computer science community even, uh, here in, the, in uh, an article from 2016, survey of 260 anatomic pathologists and 81 laboratory medical directors. And what was interesting for me that they said, have you been personally involved with a minor error? So 71% of the anatomic pathologists say yes. Have you been personally involved with a serious error? And almost half of them, 47%, uh, say yes. So that's... Um, that's quite substantial. And of course, uh, the, uh, the disclosure, we don't have much transparency. We, we have not looked into the procedures, how we disclose and manage errors in, in some aspect and as a, as a general uh, framework and platform. So it's an issue. So for example, uh, when we ask internists and surgeons, uh, uh, have you, in your disclosures, have you used the word error? So 71% of internists say yes, 14% of surgeons say yes. So, or the first one, would you definitely disclose an error to a patient? So 65% of internists say yes, 96% of surgeons say yes. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that depends on who you are, what type of, at, the, what, at what end of the clinical, um, work are you uh, active and then the responses and the numbers may be different so if you go back to let's say oncology and this these are these are markings of the prostate gland in a mri image by seven oncologists and uh, it's unbelievable how much variability is in here and prostate gland is considered uh, something really easy with its walnut shape 
And uh, if we use this type of variability, and uh, for example, in radiation oncology, and of course, we will not only miss the tumor part, the red part here, we will also impact the green part, which is healthy tissue. So it's, it's uh, the variability in oncology, uh, and specifically here in radiation oncology, is definitely a major uh, concern. And when we talk about delineation of regions of interest in images, even a simple case like prostate has almost 18% 18% of variability, bladder 32%, abdominal aorta 40%, and we get to scary numbers of pulmonary nodules up to 54%. So uh, and whenever you really want to delineate something on images, things get really uh, distinct, uh, distinctly uh, variable and different from each other. Going back to pathology, so there is a large number of uh, reports uh, that look at the observable variability here, 20, uh, 20 sections given to four observers, and people are reporting kappa values below 30%, so 0.3%, which is uh, it's, it's really uh, is not really good numbers that we want to see in terms of agreement, but for some of the cases, appear to be some consensus in, in this report. So that's a, that's a relatively old one, 1996. Uh, when we look again, and for example, bone marrow uh, in uh, uh, bone marrow uh, pathology, and we are looking at the differences of subjective evaluations of three pathologists on the left, we see uh, how variable they are. So you don't even need to calculate any numbers to, to appreciate uh, the differences. But also when we look at, uh, WHO has established independent factors. You can still see uh, you can still see the variability. So it's not it's not really about what what are the criteria. So the variability will be uh, will be there and will be embedded anyway. So uh, another example. So a uh, uh, the looking at interobservable variability for squamous and non-squamous non small cell lung cancer and. Uh, so the percentage of agreement was anywhere in this study between 67% to 90%. So, and uh, based, on, based on the primary uh, uh, analysis of the data, the differentiation uh, uh, of non-squamous and squamous uh, histology range from 77% to 94%. So kappa values of 0.48 to 0.88. So, um, it, 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 you, you, and you can see different uh, similar numbers uh, for different organs and uh, 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 subtypes if you're talking about cancer. So uh, another example is uh, here uh, for, um, for breast carcinoma, 143 whole slide images. And this was, uh, if I remember correctly, this was specifically looking at virtual microscopy or digital pathology basically, and uh, six pathologists looking at it. This is one of the things that has been missing because we know that variability does exist in the conventional microscopy, but, uh, and we have a high concordance in diagnosis between uh, microscopy and digital pathology, but there are not many studies who have looked at, okay, if I go digital, will the variability increase or decrease? So here among the six pathologists, we had a kappa of 0.497, and this was about grading of, uh, of breast carcinoma. And when we talked about the grading of FAIR, so grade, so grade two was, uh, we had a FAIR agreement and uh, grade three, we had a moderate agreement. And for grade one, we had a good agreement. So most likely intuitively the results can be understood. So uh, when things get really uh, dominant then uh, perhaps finding an agreement is uh, much easier. What is a scary, to me, as a as as a non pathologist, as a as a computer scientist, is the intra observable variability. So, because the, uh, you can intuitively understand that if uh, experts sitting down and they have uh, they are coming from different corners of uh, anatomic pathology with different experiences and different specialties, uh, eventually they may disagree with each other. But uh, if if I have just one pathologist, then the intuition of normal citizens like me as non-clinicians is that, that that colleague, that pathologist should always do the same things. Of course, we know that that's not the case. And uh, in just to give you one example, so uh, uh, three separate reviews of uh, agreement of each individual with himself or his, himself, uh, herself was moderate. 
So we had we had uh, agree agreement uh, around 50%. So capital value is from 0 0.33 to uh, 0 0.75. So which means if you give the same case to the same pathologist, you, you would get different you would get different results. And of course, we know that again from literature, but it's just uh, uh, is is just to uh, to point out that it's not about that different pathologists disagree with each other. So the variability is something deeper than that, that people disagree because they have different level of knowledge. So, well, variability is probably the source of almost all problems we have. Uh, so that, and the question is, so what's going on in medical imaging? Well, we have misdiagnosis, we definitely have. And then beside of that, because of that, and uh, depending on that, we have also inaccurate and improper treatment planning. So uh, what is the reason for probability? Well, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Some of the reasons could be, well, the information is imperfect. Uh, the imaging is imperfect. The anatomy uh, is in, uh, imperfect in terms of there is no uh, clear boundary. So the complexity of diseases and how they manifest themselves in, in the shape of tissue is definitely not something that you cannot draw yes and no lines in many, many cases. And of course, the human perception uh, visual perception is inherently subjective. So, um, among others, this is this this list by no means is a complete list. The reason of uh, variability, it, it, it's it's a problem that probably and some of the papers even suggest that just make your make your peace with it. So there is variability, accept it, but just account for it and be prepared to deal with it. I'm not sure I want to accept it. So I, I, I think we can do something about it. So um, what are the consequences of variability? Well, we, we get based on that error or variability. Uh, so you, uh, and if there is a wrong diagnosis and there is the wrong planning uh, treatment of the patient or non-treatment of the patient or side effects for the patient, could be a prolonged treatment for the patient. It could be reduced patient throughput for the clinic and hospital. It could be financial burdens for the healthcare system. And of course, there could be legal ramifications de depending on what type of healthcare system you are uh, talking about. Everybody's talking about precision medicine and uh, most of the time people mean uh, to predict uh, what type of treatment protocol are likely to succeed for a specific uh, patient depending on various patient attributes and treatment context. There is no question that if you don't have the right diagnosis, the projected or the estimated treatment won't be uh, correct either. So that they go hand in hand. I cannot really separate a diagnosis and treatment in my head as a non-clinician. Okay, what can AI do? There have been a lot of buzz uh, about, about AI. We have supervised techniques, we have unsupervised techniques, we have weekly supervised techniques. It could be algorithmic and topological. And topological are the so-called deep networks. Uh, unsupervised AIs are mainly uh, uh, clustering and search, matching. And weekly supervised is about interaction, being online and interacting with human experts in order to learn. So uh, supervised, you need a lot of labeled data. So, and when you talk about labeled data, that somebody gives you diagnosis or delineate the, the, the part of the image that uh, are of interest, then of course you will have the variability in it. So any 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 AI solution that has been trained with labeled data, who, who labeled the data? So uh, did you account for observer variability, yes or no? Most of the time, uh, I, I don't see it in the literature. So weekly supervised, you don't have labeled data, but you give some sort of feedback, reward and punishment uh, to the agent to do its job. And unsupervised, that there is no teacher, there is no reward and punishment. You just operate the techniques, operate on raw data. You just give the images and the reports, and the uh, the software tries tries to figure something out. So uh, artificial intelligence is a big field, and uh, machine learning is a subset of that. Uh, and artificial neural networks (NNs) are a smaller part of machine learning. Uh, support vector machines as a classifier is a part of machine learning. Decision trees and expert systems have been uh, have been uh, going around for quite some time. Random forest are relatively a new development of machine uh, of decision trees. Natural language processing (NLP) is a, has become a big part of uh, of um, AI and sophisticated systems like BERT and 
BioBird have uh, have been emerging in the past two two years, and uh, older techniques like fuzzy systems and meta heuristics like evolutionary optimization have also been around. So what 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 is uh, quite successful in the past uh, four or five years are the deep is the deep learning, which is a small part of uh, artificial neural networks, uh, and uh, this is where where we get uh, and hear about really impressive results. Okay, so what is the ultimate solution for observable variability? That's a, that's a tough question to ask, and everything I say is not is not really a solution that we can say we can use it tomorrow. But it's based on everything we know. Something that we should we should go in that direction. Something that we should look at it as as potential uh, solution. So how can it, can it, can AI remove observable variability? So if I have an image and I classify. Would that solve my problem? Because when I classify the image, I, most of the time I get yes and no. Is it long adenocarcinoma, yes and no? Or I'm after the grading. I want to grade, uh, uh, I know what it is. I just want to grade it. And with the classification comes some sort of confidence or likelihood, 96%. So I, I classify this as a squamous cell carcinoma with 96% uh, uh, confidence. Would that help me to, uh, to uh, um, um, get rid of observable variability. Well, if you get all pathologists to accept this output, then yes. Uh, but is that possible? Is that possible? That would that would imply a full automation, that it, which means so we, we just give the task, we take the task from the pathologist and we give it to AI and whatever AI gives us, we accept. Okay, then of course the variability is removed because uh, these techniques are well, uh, quite uh, consistent in the way that they do things. But how likely is it that we accept full automation? I, from today's perspective, not very likely because we, we cannot understand this decision. So we won't accept them. And there is not, there is not much perspective in short term that the classifications, which are the most successful deep learning techniques there are. Most successful AI solutions are classifiers. So, and they have a lot of value. We are, I'm, we are not dismissing their value. I, we are just asking, can, beside the value that they provide, can they get rid of observable variability? I would say no from today's perspective. We can generate fake images, synthetic images. Can that uh, remove the variability? I, I'm not sure because they, are, they create additional information that we have to basically analyze. If what happens if you segment the image? What happens if you find and delineate automatically using AI? Segment? Why? That, that's great. That's quantification. That's the, fundamentally the same thing as classification because you classify pixels. But then again, it would help to remove the variability if everybody accepts the result. So if everybody and, and uh, guaranteed, if, the, if those segmentation techniques and delineations have been uh, trained with uh, labeled data coming from a few pathologists, then the likelihood is is really large that they, the result won't be accepted as, as, as a consensus. What about search, which is my favorite? So what about search? You give me an image and I give you a, some, a set of similar images. Can that solve the problem of variability? Well, okay, so if I, I'm looking at an image and I have a large archive of histopathology images, and they are indexed, so which means I can I can I can uh, search in that archive. I can send my query and say, "What is that?" And some sort of a smart algorithm can search in that archive and send me back similar cases and say, "Well, yes, we, we could find some similar cases." And with the similar cases come some metadata, the reports, the outcomes, everything comes back, and then I can look at it. Well, this is not something new, actually, because the pathology consultations than the atlases that we use are basically image search. So uh, when we consult each other, when pathologists consult each other, so fundamentally you are doing an image search in your mind. We don't know in your head, in your brain. We don't know how we do it, but we do it. And when we look in atlas, it becomes more explicit. If I look at, if I grab one of the WHO's uh, tumor classification blue books and I go to the pages and I try to find a case as similar to what I see under the microscope on the, or on the screen, fundamentally I'm doing image search in my brain. So we are doing it, but we are not doing it with computers. So, uh, and the, we know the benefit when we consult and when we look at the atlases, we know the benefit, but it's cumbersome, it's time consuming, it's not efficient. 
So if, if we had the possibility to search, if we could send an entire biopsy sample and say, okay, can you find another patient similar to my patient? If it was possible to send a small part of the tissue, if I'm looking at the detail and I'm looking at really at 40 eggs and I am really interested in uh, minute uh, uh, distinctions that I'm looking at, or if I could select a region of interest in whole slide image and send that to the search engine, would, would that help? Would that help to, uh, to search? Would that be possible to do that? Well, if I'm looking at an image and let's say I have some doubt uh, and I send it to an image search engine and say, okay, I, have you had a case like this? So this is the consultation. So that's what we uh, call virtual peer review. And then the search engine goes and finds other biopsy samples that are similar to my patient. And of course, then the data comes with it, the reports and the outcomes and the treatments and everything else. And if there's any uh, molecular data, all comes back. Of course, all those information, um, the, the pathologist who's asking that is one person and the other information is coming from other pathologists who have already looked at other cases, evidently diagnosed cases, and they are in the system and we are looking at them. So that's what, that's what we call a virtual peer review. So you basically tap into the knowledge and wisdom of your other colleagues and yourself in the hospital, in the clinic. And uh, what comes is not just a yes or no, it comes similar cases. And yeah, I have seen a case like that and it was papillary thyroid carcinoma. So, which means what? If I have a query whole slide image as a pathologist and I send that to a search engine, and we get multiple cases and with the report. So basically we could build a computational consensus. And the more we retrieve, the more we find, the easier it becomes to find consensus. So then the magic is, okay, give me access to a large archive. The more, it, the more I have to, at my disposal, the more long cases I have, the easier it should be to find cases to remove the uh, uh, and the, uh, the squamous uh, case uh, that caused variability that I mentioned at the beginning. We, we cannot really put some value on top of search unless we talk about natural language processing and the reports and the, all the metadata that we have. So at most of the reports we have at the moment are unstructured. So the pathologist just sits down and write the reports depending on uh, the practices in different hospitals and clinics. But we are also moving in towards structured reports, synaptic reports. And if, if synaptics report emerge and are widely used, that makes the job of the computers and for search a lot easier. So uh, natural language processing can help to categorize reports and notes. It can auto-generate reports. Yes, it can. At the moment, it's very primitive. But uh, down the road, it can be done quite sophisticated, again, provided that we have access to a large number of uh, uh, good reports, which is not a given uh, uh, in, in the short term. So there's a lot of um, a lot of obstacles to get there. And conversational AI, when the pathologist can just talk to an AI agent and ask questions to clarify something. So uh, when we look at pathology reports, there's there's uh, from simple things to sophisticated things. There's a lot of things we can do with the reports. We can get. A, a significant keywords out, we can recognize topics, we can highlight those things, we can summarize it such that uh, when we uh, bring back the search results, uh, we can also highlight those keywords in the corresponding uh, reports of the matched cases such that the comparison and decision making becomes uh, uh, easier and more efficient for the pathologist. Many people have started to not just look uh, 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 at whole slide images and their annotations for training some sort of AI techniques here, a visual dictionary approach, but also, as you can see on the left, also uh, using reports, diagnostic reports from the past cases as training data. So you put in both images and reports such that uh, the AI has a better chance to distinguish cases from each other. And then you go online and use this system. Of course, there is no report for the new patient uh, for the new patient, you just get the biopsy sample, the whole slide image, and then you do whatever you need to do. Uh, is, it, is it, for example, reason score prediction in this case for, uh, for processing? Something really interesting is clinical report generation. Is This is one example. 
Uh, on the left, you see that the actual report is saying the nuclei are severely pleomorphic. And the first sentence in the green text below it, which is generated by the computer, is, says the nuclei are severely pleomorphic. Of course, it's not always that easy. Uh, it's uh, the research community as quiet at the beginning, I would say, mainly not because of the technology, again, because lack of access to large uh, number of data. And getting one million reports is not easy. So we, uh, if they are clinical reports and uh, they are in hospital, uh, it's not, uh, uh, to my knowledge, nobody has published any paper uh, with, uh, with a large number of uh, clinical reports, uh, evidently diagnosed cases. But we have initial investigations that show this is possible. We can, we can auto-generate reports. And if I have access to matched cases, we can basically auto-generate reports for, them, uh, for, the, for an unseen case for a new patient. So which means what? Which means if you give me the query and I go in and find the top three, it could be top five, top 10, top 100 similar cases, and I bring back those reports using natural language processing, we could also put together the green report here and say, not only just say this is popular thyroid carcinoma, but also provide more information through a, the, through a, a repository of NLP techniques and provide editable synaptic reports to the pathologist. Again, the pathologist has to stay in the loop. The pathologist cannot go anywhere. The pathologist has to there and look at the data and say, yeah, okay. So it could be also uh, upon request. So we, we don't want to bias what the, how the pathologist is working. Uh, uh, and if systems like this get established, and then we can talk about and work toward establishing guidelines for using them. But at the, uh, in the short term, we have to look at some cases and see what would be the effect of using systems like this, so specifically matching similarities and image search, on uh, reducing, eventually reducing the observable variability. So there is a long way to go, but, uh, but things are quite, uh, uh, quite interesting and quite, uh, um, uh, um, quite exciting at this stage. So I will, uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, see whether we have uh, any questions. My thanks there to Hamid for his talk. Um, a couple of questions, Hamid, have come in on the, uh, on the right-hand side. Um, first of all, um, Aston has asked, um, how are the rapid changes in terminology and the diagnostic techniques incorporated? NIFTP versus PTC, uh, gliomas in general. So you mean how the diagnosis? Are you in the? Um, it'd be easier, Hamid, if you can see them yourself. Are you in the plenary stage chat? Um, you'll see the questions coming in on the right hand side. No, so let me see. I have to. Of course, yeah. Yeah. So let me. Okay, so the chat, okay. So um, the question I asked there was from Aston Powers. So it's in the chat box? Yeah, how are the rapid changes in terminology and diagnostic techniques incorporated? NIFTP versus PTC, and glomers in general? Well, uh, uh, I have to generally say that at the moment, uh, nobody has made it to the clinic. So that's a tough question for me because we still have to work, I, I would say at least one or two years to get something substantial to the clinics before we can answer this type of questions. So at the moment we have a lot of stuff on the research side. There is a lot, many, many activities and initiatives are going on to make sure that we also uh, look at the user acceptance and the regulatory side of things, uh, FDA, and uh, for us in Canada, Health Canada, to, to bring the technology so uh, and make it available. And then we can uh, answer questions like that. At the moment, you can only, based on the uh, research results and the, uh, the validations on mainly non-clinical data, so research data, uh, you can say that it will bring a lot of changes, but what type of changes? How would that be? I, I'm really, I'm really hesitant to make any prediction in that regard. 
we know that we can change a lot. So the, when I say we, I mean the community at large, um, pathologists, computer scientists, AI specialists, policymakers, administrators, all together. Uh, uh, we can we can bring about a lot of changes, but we have not done it yet. So there, there is no major uh, diagnostic system deployed in pathology uh, yet, to my knowledge, uh, that can be used on a daily basis for making clinical decisions. So we have to wait for that. Um, everything I say comes from the research side of things, uh, all of them encouraging, but uh, uh, again, we don't have hard clinical uh, 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 data to back things up, which I'm not worried about it, but but we don't have them yet. Sure, and I realized I've missed a question that was asked earlier, and it was from Stanley Cohen. He asked them, um, are you defining benign versus error in terms of difference from a subsequent expert or consensus diagnosis or based on actual patient outcome? Well, I, ideally, we want actual patient outcome. That would be the gold standard. So, but uh, at the moment, again, when you talk about research, we, we uh, uh, when you have when you rely on uh, reports, then you have to make sure that you have evidently diagnosed cases, which is again based on outcome. Again, I do not know any major uh, uh, major test and major validation that has done that. So, anything that we have is heavily subject to variability. Anything we have is a few pathologists who have spent a lot of, of their time and energy and knowledge to enable uh, a, a, as a research study to uh, look at the potentials of AI for diagnosis, but uh, uh, w which is fantastic, but it doesn't solve our problem in long term because we are looking. To, if we if we don't do that, we will drag the variability with us even with AI. If the images and the reports are coming are coming from a few or even worst case scenario from one pathologist, we cannot, because AI will learn our biases. So, uh, and uh, uh, ideally it should be based on outcome, which is the absolute gold standard. We did this and that was the result. So come back in the chain and make any adjustment that you need. There was also a follow-up question to that. And apologies if you've already um, tackled some of this within that, but Thomas L. Wesseling has asked, Related to the excellent question above, in the measurement of the intra, inter and intra disagreements, has anyone ever measured the outcome impact, e.g. caught somewhere else in the workflow by other clinical indicators, etc. And how would you measure it? Tough question, not to my knowledge, but I may not be the right uh, person uh, to, to answer this question. I'm, I'm sure many, many colleagues uh, from the pathology side have much more in-depth uh, uh, overview over the reports on observer variability, not to my knowledge. And interesting is also is when we look at inter-observer variability, this is purely for research because in the practice, we do not have that luxury. We do not have the luxury to bring in three pathologists in the room to make a diagnosis. Intra-observer variability would be much more interesting because this is the daily practice. This is the daily uh, work that every pathologist in his her own room and alone with uh, struggling and fighting, uh, answering the question alone. So intra-observer variability is much more uh, pervasive and much more uh, a realistic case to look at it. I don't know, no, I, 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 I don't know that. So uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. You always had lots of uh, people mentioning that it was a tremendous, early, timely and insightful talk. But there was one other last question. Um, Regard, and it was from Zev Leifer, he asked, with regards to verbal and written natural language translation interpretation in AI, considering the vast differences between responses from Siri, Alexa, and Google, intra and intra variability, and, and your thoughts on that? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Um, it was your thoughts on, your thoughts on, verbal and written natural language translation and interpretation AI. Uh, consider the vast differences between responses from Siri, Alexa and Google, and again, inter and intra variability. And if you had any thoughts on that. Sure, uh, so generally the AI community, which I consider myself uh, a part of the AI community, does claim 
that NLP probably is much more advanced than what we have for processing images from computer vision, mainly because NLP didn't have the major computational uh, challenges as working with images does. So we have put a lot more energy into NLP and training NLP solutions have been historically a lot easier. So the progress has been made, but when you look at uh, auto captioning of natural images, when you show me a photo that you captured in park and the computer ca auto captions, as I said, a dog playing in the park, Okay, so um, uh, that, that's fine, but this is not a sensitive case that I'm looking at uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma of kidneys. So, and there we know that we have a huge variability in the terminology, especially because we have been working with unstructured data, especially because pathologists come from different backgrounds, from different school of medicine, terminologies are different and so on. So would AI be able to incorporate that, uh, that uh, pervasive variability in the language in learning such that everything that you wanna do with auto-captioning, auto-generation of report, conversational AI, would it be possible to do that? Theoretically, I like to think yes. Practically, I see a huge burden and challenge as we have for images that at the moment we do not have that large, uh, diverse archive of documents reports such that the AI can learn the diversity. Can AI learn the diversity? Yes, it can. Uh, and we know that we can counteract the bias. And the bias comes when everything comes from a few, uh, few sample, few pathologies, a few uh, clinics and hospitals. So we need, and we don't, the initiatives are missing. The initiatives are missing that hospital, major hospitals get together, multiple hospitals, maybe uh, supported by governmental agencies and create large enough, diverse enough data set to enable that. As long as we don't have that, we won't be able to exploit AI potential to uh, counteract observable variability, both in text and in final diagnosis for images. Excellent. Well, Hamid, that is um, all the questions. And uh, I think that was an absolutely fantastic talk to kick us off uh, for the second day of the conference. So my thanks uh, once again for coming on live and, and giving this talk. Thank you.